we'll get started with uh, today's content. So as mentioned, today's stuff is about machine learning. Um, but before I actually say anything about machine learning is, um, I want to get an idea from you guys about what the current conceptions about machine learning are. So there's no right or wrong answers for this question on the board. The question is, what does the phrase machine learning make you think of? Um, so this can be just in like a word association style, whether it makes a certain company come to mind or a certain kind of visualization or something come to mind. And this question goes for both uh, those of you um, in, uh, in Zoom and in person. So there's no right or wrong answers, um, but would anyone like to tell me what uh, this phrase machine learning, uh, what image just conjures to mind? AI, AI yeah, nice, nice, nice one, Connor. So AI is, um, uh, machine learning is actually a, a subset of AI. And um, so AI meaning artificial intelligence. And what, uh, what machine learning is, is a certain kind of type of AI. So AI kind of, we can think of, the, think of as the broad umbrella for it. Anyone else have any ideas? Go ahead, Casper. Yeah, uh, those researchers uh, were like, uh, they had like a task, they had like generations upon generations of machine learning, progressively get better at the task. Oh, nice one. So are you, so are you referring to this when, when it like kind of asks you about like, like what do you think of this video and stuff like that? Or is it, or is it? Yeah, I mean like, the, 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 Oh, nice one. Oh, nice one. So that's a great, so that's a great answer. So uh, to reset what Casper said for everyone. So the idea is, um, was that uh, that we have kind of algorithms that improve over time, where we, we have some type of seek. If the seekers are learning, then they're going to get better and start to catch the seekers more often. And this is a concept that we can uh, kind of bear in mind as we go forward. So let me check on Zoom if uh, there's uh, some ideas here. Uh, so Rico says, when a, uh, when a machine takes a certain task and remembers uh, what to do to complete said task efficiently, efficiently, and as it continues to learn, the efficiency increases. Again, that's a great answer, Rico. So, um, the, uh, again, the idea uh, that Rico put forward is that, um, again, we have some kind of, uh, we're giving a machine some kind of task, and the more it does it, the better it's going to get us. So these are some great answers. Any, any other quick answers before we move forward? Okay, great. So uh, that, uh, now that we have, um, now that we've figured out what kind of ideas are about machine learning, let's uh, start to see what today's content is, and then we'll find a, um, a Wikipedia definition about what machine learning actually is. For today's content, the uh, first thing we'll tackle is we'll try to learn what is machine learning. And from the answers I've heard, it sounds like there's a pretty good uh, concept of what machine learning actually is all about. We'll see some examples of machine learning, um, and this is going to include, after seeing some examples, we're going to see how to do it. And then after that, uh, I'm going to tell you guys how, if you, if you like what you see, how you can then get into machine learning. Uh, and the, the crux of that last section is that uh, MCS 275 is one of the, uh, one of the kind of uh, things that helps a lot with machine learning. Well, here's a definition. Um, and let's read this out. This is from Wikipedia. What is machine learning? It's the study of computer algorithms that can improve automatically through experience and by the use of data. Now, this is uh, pretty much exactly what has been uh, put forward um, in, in those uh, great answers. Um, and, but the, the problem is this, this, at first, this definition may seem kind of vague, but it does tell us two important things. The first thing, is uh, that it's a study of computer algorithms. And what this means for us is that um, this, can, this doesn't rely on a specialized piece of machine learning hardware or anything like that. In fact, it can be done uh, on laptops and, uh, and pretty much um, any computer nowadays. Um, the caveat for that is that there are kind of things that help with machine learning, like having a graphics card, for example. Um, I'll get into that later. Um, but uh, the fact that it's based on computer algorithms means that uh, we can uh, basically do it with any machine nowadays. Uh, and it tells us uh, it gains experience. But then another thing here that it highlights is through the use of data. Now, uh, this relates to what we were talking about with the fact that uh, we, machine learning trials need to, or when, um, when we use a machine learning algorithm, we want to um, keep on giving it experience and keep on making it learn. And that's where data uh, comes in handy for us. And uh, the way that we do this 
um, is by basically showing it the data that we want uh, that, that that we want it to use in some sense, and then we'll uh, and 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 kind of iterating over that process. And the fact that uh, machine learning uses data is one of the key reasons that uh, big tech companies nowadays find data so valuable. Uh, companies like Google, Amazon, and things like that, they're always trying to get as much data as possible out of their users. And one of the big reasons is because uh, the more data you have, the more effective you can make your machine learning algorithms. So that's something that we'll bear in mind as we go forward. Speaking of things we'll bear in mind, uh, so these uh, pictures are of my girlfriend's cat, uh, pets, and um, I think they're very cute. But uh, we're going to use this as um, as an example to bear in mind as we go throughout today. So uh, this is a bit of motivation, and the, this question, the question on this slide is: How do we write a program to find out whether an image is of a dog or a cat? Um, so, given any image, how do you find out whether it contains a dog or a cat? Now, the answer is that given traditional programming methods, this is going to be extremely difficult. Maybe you might come up with certain ideas in your head, like maybe you can use some, some stuff regarding like pillow or something to find out, you know, where are the eyes, try and find out like dark pixels or stuff like that, and then try to find out like the shading, the framing and all that. But um, the idea is that um, this will seem like a very difficult task. But the good thing is that this task is very well suited to a machine learning algorithm. So, uh, you know, we, we may be able to write a, write a, write a program that uh, successfully detects that this image contains a cat, but uh, let's, say, let's say we very slightly shifted it over, maybe it would completely fail. Maybe, uh, maybe the lighting would uh, be slightly brighter and stuff like that. And um, basically we're gonna have um, a very difficult time with writing something like this. But uh, something that's interesting with this is that uh, this problem, despite being very difficult to program, to us, it's obvious. Like, obviously, this contains a picture of a dog and a cat. And so what machine learning is very good at is detecting patterns in some data. So let's bear in mind the dog or cat example as we move. So what I'll tell you next about are the main kind of types of machine learning. And uh, we'll kind of solidify these with some examples as we move forward. But we have two main types, and there's a third I'll show you, but this is, these are the two main types we'll bear in mind. We have uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. And what supervised learning uh, tells us is that the data is labeled. And what we mean by a label is that we have some kind of input data. So for example, images of dogs and cats. But then we also have kind of a correct answer. So if we had a data set full of images of dogs and cats, and if it was labeled, then each image of a dog would also come with a little tag on it saying, yes, this is a dog, or yes, this is a cat. On the other hand, unsupervised learning means we don't have that. And these two approaches can kind of help us in different ways that we'll see as we move forward. Now, as mentioned, there is a third type. I will go over this only briefly, but uh, this third type is called reinforcement learning. Um, and I think this uh, can kind of... Um, this, this, th I think Casper's example of having a, like a hider and a seeker falls into this category. But what reinforcement learning is, is kind of like a Pavlovian kind of um, style of machine learning, where we have an agent that can do whatever it wants, but we tell it, okay, we're going to give you a reward when you do something that we consider good. Um, that's something that we're going to kind of ignore for now. We're just going to focus on supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, because reinforcement learning is kind of its own beast and is um, only, um, I would say, tangentially related. But what's interesting about super, uh, reinforcement learning is that it can be used in things like, uh, you know, AI in uh, video games. It's used in self-driving cars. It's used in marketing and things like that. But we won't see too much of it. So we'll see some quick examples of each of these two types of learning. And then we'll uh, move forward into uh, actually trying some of these. Or one of these, I should say. So one of the examples of unsupervised learning, which if we recall is when we don't have labels for our data, is uh, recommendation systems. So this can apply to uh, when we're searching uh, things on Google, for example. Um, it wants to come up with the best suggestions possible that most accurately match what the user is thinking. 
But that said, we don't have like a tag for our data. We're not able to say, uh, we're, we're not able to read the user's mind and get some, some target there. So it will try to maximize some objective in a way, i.e. user satisfaction or, um, or things like that. Similarly, um, we have Amazon, Amazon suggestions. Um, we might want to, where they might want to um, show us suggestions for products that we are most likely to buy or are most likely to spend the most amount of money on. And so they have an objective of maximizing um, some, uh, some objective. Similarly with YouTube and TikTok suggestions, um, they may want to maximize things like watch time and things like that. Um, although the YouTube algorithm, I believe is, um, what it maximizes, I believe is a secret, but um, the, the, the general knowledge is that um, it somehow wants to maximize watch time in some way. So uh, as we can see with all of these, uh, these unsupervised uh, learning kind of examples, they don't have a true answer that they're going for. We're gonna see more unsupervised learning. Another way we can do unsupervised learning is something called dimensionality reduction. So this means um, if we have some data, we want to make it have um, fewer dimensions without losing its meaning. So almost like compression in a way. And this can often be done as like a pre-processing step to do maybe some more machine learning. So as an example, maybe um, if we think of ourselves as being the company Netflix, they might want to do uh, dimension dimensionality reduction um, on the set of liked movies by users. So for example, if we wanted to find out some information about what one user likes, um, we could use, you know, the whole, maybe we could make a whole array out of all the movies they've ever liked, and then it would be zero for every movie ever that they've never seen. That would be a huge amount of data. But we may want to compress that instead and maybe find some patterns in it, for example, like saying, okay, they actually like all maybe drama movies starring Benedict Cumberbatch or something like that. So uh, that's what dimensionality reduction is. And again, that's another example of unsupervised learning. One more example of unsupervised learning is called clustering. What this is about is finding suitable groups for unlabeled data. So for example here, uh, let's say we had some data on some axes, and maybe let's think of this as being our dogs and cats example. Maybe these axes represent something interesting, like maybe the bottom axis represents like the angle of the ears or something, and then the top axis um, represents maybe the color of the eyes or something like that. Uh, these are just made up examples. But uh, because it's unsupervised learning, we don't have these tags saying, yes, this image contains a dog, or yes, this image contains a cat. What, what we do with clustering is we try to find underlying patterns within this data. So uh, we may see that, okay, there's a, there's a group of uh, points here, and maybe this corresponds to maybe all, uh, all dogs, maybe this corresponds to all cats, and then, well, there's a third one, so let's say all um, hamsters or something. So we haven't labeled these already, but we found some underlying, um, some underlying patterns within our data. Now moving on to supervised learning, we, uh, we can have some, uh, well, there's two main types of uh, supervised learning. One of them is called classification. And this is the example we saw with dogs and cats, where if we want to um, assign uh, labels to some data with distinct categories. So for example, if we want to decide whether we had either a dog or a cat, on the other hand, we have another type of uh, supervised learning, which is called regression. And uh, for anyone who's taken stats, this is uh, similar to what it means in a, in a stats sense. But this means if we have continuous labels. So for example, if we had some information about all students' midterm scores, would we then be able to predict maybe their final score? So I'll give us some graphs to emphasize this difference here. And first, let's take a look at this graph of classification. In both graphs, we have a whole bunch of data and we have two lines. But the difference here is that um, in this classification example, again, maybe this is maybe it's the angle of the ears and maybe it's the color of the eyes. But in this classification example, we are trying to find, for example, a decision, a decision boundary. So maybe we would say that everything to the left of this is a dog and maybe everything to the right is a cat. 
On the other hand, regression might be a bit like uh, what you, you might have done in science class, where you might have had to say, uh, you know, given this data, plot a line of best fit or something. And then let's say uh, along the x-axis here, we had students' midterm scores. Maybe these were their final scores. And then let's say we had a new piece of data here, maybe right where my mouse pointer is. Uh, let, this corresponds to maybe about uh, 90 or so um, on the x-axis. Then maybe we could say, okay, this corresponds to um, about an 80 on the final, for example. Um, this is a completely made up example, and this doesn't apply to any class in particular. So uh, you may be thinking so far that these examples are all well and good, but really, how do any of them work? And uh, if you're thinking that, then that would be a, uh, a great question. So the answer to that is that most of these, all of these algorithms kind of have their own different ways of working. But there is a big uh, kind of tool that can help us uh, with machine learning. Now, this doesn't encompass all of the examples we've seen, but uh, something that, uh, that, that helps us is something called a neural network. And this is something that's going to be really interesting and shows us how this kind of learning algorithm can work, or one of the ways that we can write a, uh, a learning algorithm. So I'm going to define something for you, and I'm going to call this a neuron. And uh, neuron in the usual sense, uh, we may think of as being like, you know, something within the brain, uh, like a little kind of, it, it does something. I'm not a neurologist, but um, it, does, it does something in the brain. And this is going to be the same idea for what machine learning me, uh, uses a neuron for. Uh, it's kind of going to be our kind of building block for making a network of these neurons. So uh, we have an example here of what a neuron may look like. It's going to take in some inputs. Uh, in this example, it's going to take in three inputs. And then what it's going to put out is it's going to do something very simple. It's just going to add them up and multiply each of them by a certain number. So we say uh, the output here will be input one times weight one. And weight one is going to depend on neuron. But basically, it's going to output some number. And so overall, this neuron isn't really doing anything special. It's just kind of saying, OK, um, I'm going to take these numbers and add them up. That's something that's easy. And uh, again, this, these weights are going to vary depending on what the neuron is. And we can have different, uh, different sizes of inputs here. Um, so they're very basic. They don't do very much. But what if we put a whole bunch of them together? This is what makes uh, something called a neural network. And these are huge collections of neurons um, as inspired by kind of um, biological brains. And what we may think of, uh, how we may think of these working is, uh, let's say we want to give uh, some data to a neural network. We would have what's called this input layer here, right where my mouse pointer is. And let's say we were trying to train it to recognize dogs or cats. The way that we would give it an input is maybe we would say we could use something like what we know this week from uh, about pillow is we can you know maybe flatten an image into a 1D array. And then we can say, okay, this is the brightness of pixel one, pixel two, and so on and so forth. So we're able to feed in um, data in this way, and we can even feed in images. What we get is an output layer. So this one has three. So maybe let's, again, pretend that we have three types of data, dogs, cats, um, hamsters, or something like that. What this uh, neural network is going to do is, first off, it's going to start off not knowing anything. It's just going to have random weights. We're going to give it in something, and we're going to give it something that's obviously a dog, and then maybe you'll say, okay, yeah, that's a hamster. We're going to say no. Um, but what's going to happen is that it's going to have some output here telling us what it thinks the image is. And if we're doing image classification, the way that this is going to work is uh, maybe this first neuron here will correspond to dogs, then to cats, and then to hamsters. Uh, and then we can say take um, its prediction to be whatever the, sh the strongest output out of these neurons is. And so, um, again, it's going to start off kind of making random guesses. Uh, we're going to put in some data. It's going to kind of do something completely arbitrary to it. And then we're going to say, OK, that was terrible. It doesn't do anything. But this is where the whole learning aspect is going to come in. We can say, OK, keep on giving it, uh, if we can find a way so that whenever we show it a dog and it gets it wrong, we can then say, OK, no, hang on. This, this, this was a dog. Here's what you need to do next time. And we'll get into uh, in a moment about how uh, this works. But the idea is that um, it's going to um, use calculus in some way to correct itself for next time. 
So we're going to define something uh, that's called a loss function. Now, uh, this is taking a step away for a moment from this neural network thing, but this, these loss functions, um, they do something they do something they, 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 they do something that a neural network is going to need. So let's say we gave um, maybe 10 images of dogs and cats to our neural network. Um, this loss function is going to measure basically how far off of what we wanted it to be is the answer. So uh, maybe a basic way to define a loss function would be uh, say, okay, add one to the loss function if it gets it wrong. Otherwise, don't add one to the loss function. And then the higher the loss function is, the further away our neural network is from being correct. Now, uh, loss functions are defined usually in uh, more complicated ways than that, but that's the basic idea of things. And then we can use calculus to make this as small as possible. So uh, if we visualize maybe a hypothetical loss function, what I have here on the x-axis is the weight of some neuron. Now, this is going to be only a tiny little aspect when our overall, um, in our overall neural network. But the key here is that as we show more examples to our neural network, we want to change these weights so that uh, the values of these weights are going to be, uh, are going to make the loss function as small as possible. So we're trying to optimize the loss function. So let's give us an idea of what this is gonna look like. Let's say uh, we initialized random values in our neural network. Maybe our initial value is going to be here for some weight of this neuron. Now again, recall that these neurons are, are going to start off not doing anything. They're just, uh, well, they're going to do something, but not very much. They're going to say, okay, take in uh, some, some values, add them up, and then, uh, and then give us an output multiplied by some values. So let's say for some weight uh, of some neuron, we have this initial value. This is going to correspond to some value within our loss function. What we can then do is uh, using calculus, and I know this is uh, pretty much skipping over a lot of the details, but using calculus, we can find the gradient of this neuron. So uh, it's going to look something, uh, something like this. And notice, usually uh, the gradient would maybe have an arrow pointing this way, but I have an arrow pointing this way. And the reason for this is that we want to say, okay, next time, change this weight so that it's in the direction of this gradient. So maybe we want to say, okay, if our initial guess was here, and let's say maybe this was our starting values for, neuro for the neural network, and let's say, okay, it was getting a whole load of things wrong. What we would say is, okay, hey, get things better next time. What you need to do, uh, and you being the neural network, what you need to do is you need to move this weight in this way. And then maybe next time, or after a few iterations, it would eventually, uh, the goal would be to move this, the weight of this, so that the loss function is as small as possible. We want to get as close as possible um, to this minimum value. Now I'm going to backtrack a few slides. I'm going to go back to this neural network. Overall, what this is doing is, let's say we gave it a, an image of a dog and it gets it wrong. Let's say it says, okay, the, the actual answer was a cat. We're going to get some value of our loss function from that. What we would then say is then, okay, to be more correct next time, we're going to say, hey, you need to make this loss function smaller. And because our loss function is characterizing how wrong our neural network is, we're making sure that it's wrong less often. So overall, uh, oh, and I forgot to explain kind of how this, uh, this neural network works, but uh, okay, we have our inputs uh, there. And uh, let's say we were looking at this particular neuron. The arrows on the left-hand side pointing to this, uh, to this neuron are going to be its inputs. And then each time it gets an output, it's going to send it to the next kind of layer of neurons. And um, the reason that this says a deep neural network is because there's another term, which I haven't mentioned so far, called deep learning. And this is kind of a subset of machine learning where we have these neural networks and uh, basically they're really long, or as we say, really deep. So overall, we're training our neural network to say, okay, here's how you can be more correct each time we show you something and each time it's wrong. So uh, now that we have an idea of how this works, and again, uh, I suppose I can go back through this, um, initial value would say take the gradient and then we try to get as close as possible to the minimum of the loss function for each neuron. Now that this has been uh, discussed, uh, what, what I want to show you now is how this can actually be done uh, with Python. 
So I'm going to switch uh, switch windows here, and uh, there's a uh, the Jupyter Notebook, which is available on the sample code. It's called neuralnetwork.ipynb. Um, but basically, what this is going to contain is um, a neural network to do some task. Now, uh, remember that we had the, the example earlier of dogs and cats. What we're going to do in this uh, neural network, for, uh, and this is to make it shorter and simpler, is that instead of predicting whether images contain dogs and cats, is we're going to predict, um, given an image of a digit, uh, zero through nine, we're going to predict what that digit is. So there's a few cells here. The first cell is going to open, uh, do our imports. And something that, that I've imported here is uh, some, some methods from this, um, from this package called uh, sklearn. What this uh, stands for is scikit-learn. And this is one of um, kind of, I would say three, main packages for doing machine learning within Python. So it does some imports up here, and then you, there's a cell I've already run here, hence the two here, and this is importing some data. This data set is called MNIST. It's a very famous data set within machine learning, and uh, this contains um, thousands and thousands of images of handwritten digits. And if I print out what this data set contains, so uh, this is a pandas data frame for anyone who's familiar with pandas. But, um, and notice here that there's kind of a slash here. So this is actually a very wide um, data set and it uh, has all the information about pixel one and maybe this first row can represent the first pixel, um, uh, the first image, and it'll say the brightness of the first pixel is zero and then uh, zero and so on. In fact, I can't, I don't think we see any non-zero values in there, but um, there are some. So it's gonna be mostly zeros. Uh, and this is going to be a data set containing images. So something that can help us here is if we uh, actually take a look at one of these images. So there's some code here. I defined a function to say, um, show us, um, use matplotlib to show us one of these uh, digits. And this is a handwritten five. We can change this, uh, this index here. So this, this zero means print out the digit at row zero. We can change this and view some other things on our data set. This one looks like a nine and a seven and so on. What we're gonna be doing is supervised learning. So each of these digits actually also comes with a corresponding label telling us what the correct answer actually is. Now that uh, this we have our data set set up, we're gonna create the neural network. So now there's a kind of complex looking neural network here, but this is basically what we're going to create. And uh, scikit-learn makes this very easy. So uh, we can ignore this for now. Instead, I'll draw your attention to the picture. So let's say we have a digit here. Maybe this is, so this is a number eight. What we're going to do is we're going to flatten this image so that the first pixel goes into the first neuron and then the second into the second neuron and so on and so forth. And again, when we initialize a neural network, it starts out basically randomly guessing. Now on the outputs, there's going, to be, there's going to be 10 outputs, zero through nine, and each of them uh, will correspond to how much it thinks uh, this digit is present within the image. So, um, and then again, the, 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 we're going to take this prediction to be whatever neuron on the output there is, uh, the strong, has the strongest signal. Now let's go over what this, uh, line is actually saying. So this is something I imported from scikit-learn. And again, because things are uh, kind of self-contained today, um, you don't have to worry about being asked to use scikit-learn uh, at any point throughout the course. But um, what this is going to do is uh, it's going to basically automatically set up this neural network for us. And we can do this in one line. And there's uh, some optional arguments here. It's going to say the hidden layer sizes, and we're gonna give it a, a, a tuple containing just the number 50. And this is going to mean, okay, by hidden layer, we mean all of the layers between the input and output layer. We can give it more layers if we want to. So if we wanted to say 50 comma 50, which would give us more layers. Now, uh, something that uh, you may be wondering is how, how do you know um, how many layers to give it, what size and so on and so forth. Oftentimes the answer is usually down to experimentation, but generally speaking, the more layers you give a neural network, the more powerful or the more expressive it can become. 
Now, uh, our problem here is rather um, in terms of machine learning problems, uh, it's a bit on the simpler end because we're not trying to say, for example, um, uh, we're not doing like, you know, find out what animal this is. Instead, we're doing, uh, we're doing digits. Therefore, we can just make our uh, neural network um, relatively small. And again, it does have loads of neurons, but in the grand scheme of things, this question. There's some other optional arguments here. Um, I'll briefly explain what these are to, uh, just for anyone who's curious. Solver equals SGD. This means uh, stochastic gradient descent. For anyone who's done anything about optimization, um, this is basically the idea that we uh, talked about earlier, where we say, okay, each time the image is wrong, we're going to um, use the gradient to make uh, things better. Max iteration is you know, how many times, uh, basically how much we want to train the, the network. Verbose equals true. This is just asking us to uh, show us um, outputs when we, uh, or, or tell us about what happens when we train it. And batch size means, uh, well, we can train in batches, we can show it 200 images at a time. So that sets up our neural network, and I just ran this. And then there's a line here that says, okay, let's fit this to our data. So what we're giving it is uh, these two values, x train and y train. X is going to contain all of our images and Y is going to contain all of our um, labels. Something I'm actually, I'm actually gonna scroll up for a moment because something I ne neglected to explain is that we split it into X train and X test. And um, what, we've, what we've done here is that we've reserved some of these X's and these Y's for testing. We're gonna say, okay, don't ever show this. Um, while this neural network is trying to learn, don't ever show it anything from X test and Y test. And what this will mean is that then afterwards we can see, okay, if we show a number that is never seen before, um, is it able to guess it? Um, in this notebook, I actually haven't used these, but uh, actually I have, never mind. So uh, let's scroll back down here. Uh, we uh, defined our neural network in this cell. And now uh, um, scikit-learn also makes it very easy to train our network. So our network is initialized, not really knowing um, not really knowing anything particular. But we're going to say, OK, train it. And now it's going to print out um, how well it's doing. So at the first iteration, when we showed it the first 200 back, uh, images, um, it had a loss function of 2.2. But by the end, um, its loss function kind of went way down. And now our neural network is trained. What we've just done is we've shown loads of images of, uh, of digits. And each time it's guessed wrong, we said, hey, no, wrong. That's bad. Uh, next time, um, you should guess this instead. So now what we can do is we can say, okay, we've got a trained neural network. That's very nice. What, what, what can we actually do with it? This is why we, we reserved um, some of the information from earlier. There's a cell here that says, um, that says okay, take a, take a certain image, display it to us. And then these two lines here ask uh, what the neural network, what it thinks is in this image. And this is, uh, because this is from our testing set, this is going to be a digit that has never seen before. If I run this, we're going to get out, uh, oh, we, we gave it the number nine as an image. It correctly guessed that, okay, this is a number nine. Our algorithm has just learned what a nine looks like. It's found the patterns within the data and it said, okay, yeah, this corresponds to a nine. We can try it with some more things. It's not perfect, by the way. We could try it with some more things. I'm going to change this index here. Anyone want to give me a, a random number between one and 10,000? Six, thank you, Andrew. The six was an image of a one, and it said, okay, yeah, this is a one as well. And again, it's never seen this one either. Let's try this a few more times. Um, it, may, it may get some things wrong. In fact, it'll be interesting if it gets some things wrong. Um, I'm going to go through these very fast until it finds something wrong. Um, you know, it may be fooled, for example, um, if we show it like a weird looking one, it may say, okay, that's a seven. That's something that even us as humans can do. We may say, okay, the, ta the, the top of this seven or the top of this one looks very long. Okay, that's a seven. And in fact, um, I actually sent this notebook to Professor Dumas, and that's actually what happened. So uh, he actually hand wrote some digits. Um, so he wrote, wrote it here. Um, a two, a seven, and a five. He scanned them and cropped these images, and he asked the neural network, what does he think these images are? Obviously, this, there's no way this, um, this neural network could have ever seen these before, because he literally wrote, wrote them out. What, he thought, what the, uh, the neural network thought these were, were two, one, and five. 
So uh, this two, it correctly identified patterns uh, to say, okay, this must be a two. This seven, it got wrong as a one. Um, and this five, it got correct as well. well. That's an example of a neural network. And there is a, even a bit more in this, um, in this notebook as well. Um, but this is gonna be mainly extra. And I'm gonna go over this um, in only a small amount of detail. So this imports another data set called Fashion MNIST. Uh, and this is basically the same thing, but instead of having images of digits, it has various articles of clothing. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's a sneaker here, um, there's a dress or something here, and there's a shoe here. We, uh, we can do the same thing here. This code does basically the same thing as earlier. We'd say, okay, train it on some images, save some of these image, images for later, and then ask it what it thinks um, each prediction is. Now there's a dictionary here saying, okay, um, whenever th this, this tells, uh, um, this translates our neural network's output into readable words. So, and that's because um, it has 10 outputs, zero to nine, but we want to say, okay, this zeros correspond to t-shirts and stuff. Let's test our neural network. And um, you can see that this is less successful. It thought this t-shirt was a dress, um, which, um, I guess can be uh, can can be uh, forgivable because I guess there it does slightly flare out here. But um, something that's interesting is that these machine learning algorithms can get things wrong in almost a kind of smart way by saying, "Okay, this, uh, it recognized some sort of pattern here. Too bad it was the wrong pattern." Uh, anyone want to give me another another number again between one and ten thousand? 6,802. Thank you, Connor. And it says this looks like an ankle boot. Okay, so great. So it got this, uh, got this one correct. Um, and, but uh, again, maybe because there's the fact that there's ankle boots, um, it would have been possible again that maybe it got things uh, wrong by saying, okay, this was like a, um, like a regular shoe or something. Um, are there any others? Oh, this one's really wrong. I thought this shoe was a dress. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty bad. But uh, what, we, what this uh, goes to show is that um, even with relatively simple neural networks, this, uh, you can create um, some quite powerful algorithms. If we wanted to do better on identifying these images, uh, we could use more advanced algorithms. Maybe we could add more layers. We, could, um, uh, we can uh, do some other um, algorithms to kind of pre-process the image and so on and so forth. But uh, the key idea is that it does uh, does this. So that's the uh, example on uh, neural networks. And uh, what we saw for it was that it can be used for image classification. But some of these those other quick examples we saw earlier, um, it can also uh, neural networks are also used in other contexts as well. So uh, I'm going to move back to the slides in a moment. Before I do, does anyone have any questions? Oh, go ahead, Tom. So that's a great question. So uh, are we aiming to kind of, uh, so is this relating to what we saw with this kind of visualization? Yeah, because I'll be saying how it slowly goes itself, but how does it have a curve to slowly go itself? So that's a great question. So um, if, uh, so uh, let me, uh, let me repeat my understanding um, of the question and I'll, uh, and uh, if, if, if it's uh, incorrect, then, then please let me know. Um, but I, what I believe the question is, is um, given, um, how, how basically, how do we know what this loss function looks like? The answer is that um, in, pra in practicality, um, we usually don't. It is possible to graph them out using some other advanced techniques, but this uh, loss function, as I showed you guys, is actually very um, idealized and very simplified. In reality, a loss function may be very bumpy, and that's why we use kind of this method of um, calculating the gradient of each step and moving in the direction of the gradient. If, uh, if in reality the loss function was simple like this, then we may be able to use other things from calculus, like say, okay, find out, find out where the gradient is zero and then set the answer to do that. Um, but uh, unfortunately in real life applications, it'd be quite a bit less. Uh, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Okay, sounds good. And uh, Kylie, did you also have a question? Yeah.
Yes, that, that is indeed true. So, so to repeat that, uh, the, the, uh, the question was to, uh, to uh, neural networks use the laws of matrices and linear algebra. Um, the answer is yes. So um, if I go back to our image here, um, this, uh, we can kind of think of our input layer as being one big long kind of vector. Similarly, um, we can think of the next layer being a whole long vector and the next layer being a whole long vector. And what we saw with um, the neurons, I'll go back to our image of a neuron here, is that it's doing a uh, linear, uh, it's doing a calculation in a, in a linear algebra sense. So it's taking uh, these inputs uh, and multiplying them by something and it's finding a, a linear combination of these inputs. Now, uh, in practice, these, uh, these neurons also, uh, after doing this, uh, it also can put it through a function, like uh, one common function is maybe it will say that uh, if the output is negative, then set it to zero and so on. Um, but uh, for the most part, it works quite well, even, uh, even just kind of having it um, do this linear algebra um, sense. Um, so yes, linear algebra is very important for machine. That's a great question. Uh, anyone have any other questions? This includes Zoom, by the way. Okay, sounds good. So uh, feel free to, if there's any further questions, feel free to ask them at any point. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go back to uh, where we were. We just tried the, neuro the, the notebook. Uh, and now the last part is uh, how can you guys uh, do machine learning if you're interested? So what we saw was scikit-learn. And uh, generally speaking, this is the simplest way to do uh, machine learning. Uh, it has a whole bunch of various different models that we can use. Um, it's really good for unsupervised learning. Like um, it can very quickly do things like clustering like we saw. Um, and it's great for quick implementations. There's two others here. Uh, one of them is called PyTorch and the other is called TensorFlow. PyTorch uh, is a little more popular, is a bit more popular than TensorFlow nowadays. Um, but, but what these are good for is deep learning. So where we have these kind of deep neural networks. PyTorch, I believe, was originally developed by a, uh, a developer team at Facebook and TensorFlow by a team at Google originally, um, but they are both um, open source. And um, as we mentioned earlier, um, there, no special hardware nowadays is required for machine learning. Something I mentioned earlier was that uh, graphics cards um, can really help with machine learning. And the reason for that is graphics cards um, are really good at doing loads of calculations that are really simple. And as we've seen for how uh, neural networks uh, work, um, that's the case for neural networks. But uh, for anyone who wants to do machine learning but doesn't have a graphics card, Google Colab is actually really good for that because you can actually request uh, from Google, well, I, actually, I don't know, you, there's like an option you can uh, select where you say, okay, give me like a, give me a GPU to use for a bit. Um, and this can make your machine learning a whole lot quicker than doing it on a regular computer. You can also use a gaming computer. Um, I, uh, when I do machine learning, I use my computer here, um, and that can be quite, uh, quite, quite good as well. So uh, those are the main packages that help with machine learning. And again, uh, now uh, the idea is what tools help with machine learning. Um, so the first one listed here is Python programming. I didn't give that a big tip. So um, MCS275 um, pretty much sets you up Python-wise for, um, for machine learning. Um, now, obviously, we haven't covered those machine learning packages, um, but uh, a lot of the knowledge is transferable. Other things that help a lot with machine learning are these three things there. So Kylie, like you mentioned, linear algebra is um, a great, is a, is a big part of machine learning. Calculus as well, um, because of the fact that we want to kind of use optimization by finding gradients and things like that. And statistics is really helpful for machine learning as well, um, because of the fact that we're hu using huge amounts of data. Um, and now let's say that, okay, you want to do some, uh, some machine learning. Um, some courses that are available here at UIC are these three here. Out of these, the only one I've taken is the MCS one. Um, this is mathematical theory of artificial intelligence. This talks a little more about the theoretical side of machine learning. Um, and I suspect that the CS ones are a bit more kind of applied. Um, although I have to admit, I don't really know uh, much about these machine learning courses. But the idea is that uh, these are available um, at UIC. Um, and again, these, these kind of topics can help a lot. Um, programming tip, linear algebra, um, calculus, and statistics. 
Well, to summarize, what we saw was uh, we saw the main types of uh, machine learning. We saw supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. We kind of um, we, 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 we kind of didn't give we didn't give reinforcement learning the attention that it deserves, really. Um, but uh, but that's okay. It's it's a whole kind of different beast, um, and it works um, in quite different ways from supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, but uh, generally speaking, the type of machine learning that we see often in our lives uh, with regards to um, you know, things that Google and Facebook and so on do are usually going to be uh, supervised. Um, and there is a lot of unsupervised as well. And again, reinforcement learning um, is used in certain settings as well. We saw brief examples of these and we saw, um, and we saw how to actually make a neural network as well. And the last slide here is going to be uh, some further links for anyone who's interested. This first link I can uh, I can highly recommend is by a, uh, a math YouTube channel, uh, Three Blue One Brown. And uh, when I was first getting into machine learning, um, this is what uh, really kind of explained neural networks in a great way to me. Uh, it's a series on them, and um, generally speaking, um, he has a, I, I think he has a really good way of explaining concepts in general, and it's, it's a great uh, channel in general. There's other things here. Um, there's an article um, about types of machine learning, and then there's a tutorial about uh, starting uh, your own machine learning project if anyone wants to do that. Other than that, um, that is it for today. Um, I, uh, yeah, I will be happy to answer any questions about any of this content, either now or in labs or anything. I'll be happy to help out with it or by email. Um, and uh, what I can also say is, um, yeah, if there's any questions about anything that's going on with the course or anything, um, then uh, I'm happy to help as always. Other than that, um, yeah, brief reminders about what's going on. Uh, by the end of the week, please be sure to uh, watch the uh, free, the pre-recorded lectures for Friday and Monday, um, and then things will be back to normal next week with Professor Jamal. Um, those of you who have Thursday labs, uh, that that will be going on. Um, that will be going on as usual tomorrow. So those of you who are in the Thursday lab, I will see you guys tomorrow. Other than that, um, I hope you guys all have a, uh, a great rest of your week. And um, yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, uh, I'll see you all around.